Hi, um, I'm Luigi Palombi, I'm at Australian National University. Um, I'm not really an academic. Um, I have a PhD in, in patent law, but I've been a lawyer for 30 years. And 25 of those years I've spent in intellectual property, uh, mainly in patents. In the last, well, since 1993, I've specialised in biotechnology patents. Um, and I have worked all over the world, um, luckily enough um, to be able to have done that. Um, and uh, so consequently, I'm, um, I've become fairly immersed in this whole area of what the patent system does and what it supposedly lives up to. One of the things that I want to talk to you about today, because I'm not an expert in malaria, I'm not, an exp I'm not a scientist, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about the patent system, um, is that there's an awful lot of mythology about the patent system. Um, and the myth is that without patents, we're not going to have drug development and we're not going to be able to innovate. You hear it all the time. The pharmaceutical industry is very good at pushing that message. It's a very simple message. It seems to be attractive and everybody falls for it. Um, but the reality is that uh, that's not necessarily the case. A lot of people don't know an awful lot about patent history. I mean, what you are told about patents is what someone says to you today. You, the current paradigm is almost as if that's the paradigm that's existed throughout all time. One wonders, really, how did we get to this point? What did we do before the patent system? Did we innovate? Did we not? Well, the truth is, we've only had a patent system as we know it, probably since 1900. The, uh, the British patent system really only came into existence in the modern form in 1883. The German national patent law was only passed in 1877. WIPO didn't exist before 1900. So how did we get to where we got? I mean, did you know what what motivated great minds to to develop the medical breakthroughs? Was it was it the patents, or was it the fact that there was a need to improve people's lives? And I think that if you look at history, you'll find that it's the latter, not the former. And, um, I mean, for instance, um, Switzerland. Switzerland didn't have a national patent law until 1907. Novartis, which was previously Siva, Siva Geige, etc., commenced life in Switzerland when it didn't have a patent system. Same with Roche. Um, and Germany, for instance, had a very confined and perhaps nuanced system until 1968. You couldn't actually get a patent on a pharmaceutical substance in Germany until 1969 when the law was changed. For most of Europe, you couldn't get a patent on a pharmaceutical substance per se until the European Patent Convention came into effect in 1978. In England, for instance, between 1919 and 1949, patents on chemical substances, pharmaceutical substances, were prohibited. Most people don't know this. And um, yet we have modern medicines. And in fact, some of the greatest breakthrough medicines, and penicillin being, I would say, right up there, uh, was really developed without a patent. So Matthew has, uh, or Matt's asked me to specifically talk about penicillin, and I, I, I think it's a fascinating story because a lot of people aren't aware of the ins and outs. So we know that in 1927, Fleming publishes his paper where he, he notes through some sort of uh, observation that there is a, a bacterium killing substance. Well, that paper didn't go anywhere until 1938, really. That's when Howard Florey uh, picked it up and his team and looked at it and they thought, well, here's something interesting. How do we turn this observation, which is really all it was, into a, an efficacious medicine? 
So Flory and his team, which included Ernst Chain and Norman Heatley, and there were a whole lot of other people, basically worked in an underfunded section of Oxford University between 1938 and 1941, before penicillin was ultimately developed and shown to be an efficacious medicine in humans. That took how many years? Three years. Did he have billions of dollars or millions of pounds available? No. Yet, proving that you could go from Fleming's observation to the production of the world's first antibiotic was probably one of the biggest breakthroughs and probably changed uh, the lives, well, a lot, or certainly a lot of soldiers during World War II. And yet, funnily enough, when that breakthrough happened, do you think the British government had an easy road when it came to convincing pharmaceutical companies to manufacture penicillin? No. The British government went cap in hand to the pharmaceutical industry and said, here it is, it's a product, we know it works, we just need to be able to produce it in sufficient quantity so that we can use it for the war effort. No, we're not interested. And um, it took the British government actually um, quite a lot of effort and they actually built a factory. Taxpayer funded money was put into this. They, uh, they got some of the five, the five leading pharmaceutical companies in England together and they said, look, we're just going to work this out. And they did. Um, of course, there were, there were patents granted on penicillin production and uh, that was a United States that uh, led that, and Andrew Moyer, I think, was um, on that patent. But that was to do with the fermentation process and mass production, not about penicillin itself. And of course, um, that didn't happen just magically. You know, Heatley and Flory went to the United States to help them. Why? Because we're in you know, World War II. We need to find a solution. So I think this whole idea that we need a patent system to promote drug development is, is, it's got to be re-evaluated. You know, clearly it may have a role in, certain, in respect to certain drugs, and there's no question that in the existing paradigm, um, the pharmaceutical industry has become very reliant on the patent system in order to um, you know, develop a business model that works for it. But in terms of finding a solution for some of the world's uh, most important um, uh, illnesses and treatments, I'm not sure that the patent system is really the way to forward. Now, when we talk about open source, open source is, what does it mean? Open source what? I mean, open source seems to me to be really uh, an excuse for trying to work around the patent system or in current intellectual property paradigm. Copyright, for instance. It really grew out, it grew out of this whole issue over software, patenting the source code, open source, letting the code out, sharing the code. I'm not sure how it works in terms of drug development, but let's assume it means something which allows people to use other people's intellectual property in a particular way. The question is, why should we be having intellectual property on some of the things that we're granting intellectual property over? And in terms of drug development, this is important because we're no longer just talking about drugs over chemical substances. We're not talking about you know, short molecules. We're talking long molecules. Modern drug development has changed. We're looking at biological drugs, drugs with biological activity. We're looking at research tools. There are a plethora of patents over research tools. We're talking about patents over naturally occurring biological materials. Why are we granting patents over these things? Why do we need to create an open, why do we need to talk about open source in respect of these things when perhaps we shouldn't even have patents over these things in the first place? So what's happened over the last, particularly since 1980 and so forth, is that the scope of patentable subject matter has grown phenomenally with the result that it is more and more difficult for scientists to Firstly, share that information openly. Uh, and secondly, it's created uh, a, a change in approach within universities. So around 1980, uh, 
you get this thing called the Bay Dole Act passed in the United States. Now, I don't mean to be terribly critical of, of those senators because I, I think they were well-intentioned and, intentioned and well-meaning and certainly there are one or two stellar examples and one of them actually occurred before the Bay Dole Act even passed where uh, you know, universities were able to patent certain things and, and make a lot of money out of it. Um, Stanford University is the case in point uh, with uh, Cohen and Boyer's breakthrough. And that, but, um, and that happened before the Bay Dole Act. But really, the Bay Dole Act has failed. It has, it, it, there is the, the, the data doesn't prove that actually universities are terribly good at promoting the IP that they develop. In, in fact, they're not very good at it at all. But what it's done is it's created a perception within universities that they too, like the commercial partners they wish to work with, have to create intellectual property. And what we now have are universities that actually are very draconian in the way they implement their IP policies. I mean, there are IP rules everywhere in universities. The universities, once the citadels of sharing and learning, have become part of the system, part of the mythology of the patent system. And it's having an effect all the way down through the universities. So I, I'm sort of very concerned about the way universities are reacting. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about because I'm not just making this up. Um, for three years, certain politicians and the Cancer Council of Australia and Royal College of Pathologists, etc., have been trying to get legislation passed to scale back the scope of patenting to perhaps bring back to into the public domain uh, materials that are currently being patented, natural biological materials. So the draft legislation basically says that naturally occurring biological materials, whether they're genetic or whether they're protein, doesn't matter, that exist in nature are not patentable subject matter. One would, have, one would think that that's reasonable. One would say these things are not inventions, therefore they have no business being patented. And yet, this university filed a submission against the bill. So did every, eight, every sandstone university in this country. So did Walter and Eliza Hall. So did the Garvin. Right? These are all institutions that rely on taxpayer-funded research. I mean, Walter and Eliza Hall gets out of its $77 million operating budget in 2010, 55 million of that came from the Australian taxpayers. Yet these, these organisations are arrogant enough to file submissions against a bill which merely tries to open up the field so that research can happen freely. There's no, no need for open source, no need for you know, licensing re requirements. Just get it out there. And they all filed submissions against it, and they weren't the only one. Scientist after scientist after scientist. My God, says the Murdoch. You know, this is going to threaten our ability to conduct research because we're not going to be able to get the funding for our research because we can't get a patent on a gene. And when we talk about, you know, the Gates Foundation, my goodness me, don't think that the money that the Gates Foundation gives out comes without strings. It certainly does come with strings. I won't mention names or organisations because the information I've been given is fairly sensitive, but I can tell you that uh, an Australian vaccine development um, for a uh, tropical disease, um, which would help many, many infants in third world, um, the funding for, let's say, human trials, it's the subject has to be the subject of a patent. It's actually mandated in the, uh, by, the, the, by the granting authority. So what are we doing? What are we doing? We're creating a whole series of monopolies and then we're trying to find a solution calling it open source. I'm not critical of, of the surprise. I'm not critical of those who are trying to 
pursue this, but I am critical of the current system, which, which means that we're running around trying to find solutions when really what we need to do is clear the path, clear the way. Look at, this, look at what we have and say, do we need to go back in time? And uh, I think you'll find that if we look at history, look at what happened with penicillin and other uh, major drugs. I mean, look at polio vaccine. That wasn't patented. And what did, what did Salk say when he was asked, you know, why don't you take out a patent? Well, can you patent the sun, he says. So I think the message that I'd like to uh, uh, sort of hand over to you is that I think scientists have become part of the problem because you've actually all become susceptible and vulnerable to the myth that you need patents in order to A, get your funding for your research, and your universities aren't helping you, your research institutes aren't helping you there, and certainly the drug companies aren't going to help you there. I mean, sure, they'll, they'll, they'll be happy to share money and give you money, but with strings, always with strings. No one's in... Pharmaceutical land, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Okay, Just remember that. If you accept money from, from a pharmaceutical company, there are going to be strings. They are not some benevolent organisation or group of organisations. I'm not against drug companies, by the way. They have a role to play. I'm just saying to you, we need to recalibrate and have a more balanced and nuanced approach. Okay? I have, a, I, have, I have a question. Um, I work for one of these organisations. This, uh, can, you, can, you CS... name, can you name them? Yeah, the CSIRO. Ah, we are right. a government work where we're funded by taxpayers' money, but not completely funded by taxpayers' money. We have been tasked by the government to you know, earn part of our keep. As a research organisation, we've been tasked to not deliver science anymore, but I'm sure we have been tasked to deliver science, but actually also to deliver budget. Yeah. Diagnose the problem for and they're susceptible. We've got incredibly strong IP protection for everything we yeah. do. I know the problem for us, but how, now give me a solution, how do I go back to my management and, and actually make the, the argument to them? How do I show them a path forward in a way that they can, they can, they can understand? Yeah. And I, I haven't gotten it from... Who's your CEO? CEO? Sorry? Who's the C CEO of Cyro at the moment? Megan Clark. Who is it? Megan Clark. Megan Clark. Isn't, who's the head of the CSIRO? Yeah. Megan Clark. Yeah. Yes. What's her background? Is she a scientist? She's a, she's a scientist. Yeah, okay. I just thought, I just thought somewhere along the line that, that someone that run, ran the CSIRO was, um, was an ex Macquarie banker or something or other. Oh, okay. The, the chairperson. That's not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, look. In the good old days, the CSIRO was properly funded, um, and now it's not. Yeah. Right. And the reason why it's not, the reason why it's not, is because uh, uh, governments have become increasingly open to the idea that they should um, not be involved in spending taxpayers' money on these sorts of risky, you know. And, and it's somehow that, that all of the government institutions should be able to fend for themselves in a commercial environment. Well, I don't know. Does, is it working? Is, this, is CSIRO able to survive without public money? No, it's not. It's, in fact, it's probably very reliant on public money. The amount of money that it actually earns from its commercial ventures is not that great, right? Well, they are, <coughs> they are significant. It, but, uh, but you can't rely on, you can't survive without public money, right? Except the, the, the majority, public that's public right. So, um, is there a solution? Yeah, I reckon just go back. Let's, get, let's just get rid of all of this nonsense about um, public-private partnerships yeah, and, and, and go back and fund, fund research the way it should be, the way it used to be. But, sure, it's easy to 
go and well, it's it's, look, it's, it's, it's actually a political. It's a policy and political decision. You know, we can spend hundreds of billions of dollars on defence. We don't seem to bat an eyelid when it comes to spending money for the military, right? We don't we don't bat an eyelid when it comes to sinking more billions of dollars into the car industry, right? We don't bat an eyelid spending money on a whole lot of things, but when it comes to R and D we get a bit sensitive. When it comes to funding universities, we become sensitive. The problem here is, ladies and gentlemen, that the policy makers in Canberra need to be to, to reassess their points of view. The problem is that a lot of them over, really since, since 1980, and I, and I actually think that the, uh, the Hawke government who started all of this, this liberalisation process, I think we have to look at really what has happened and reassess it and say, is it working? Is it actually producing the good? The Bay Dole Act hasn't worked. This whole idea that somehow universities are able to turn intellectual property into money, which means that the government doesn't have to fund the tertiary education sector, has that really worked? Where's the data to show that it's worked? I think after 30 years there should be some data. Why aren't decisions being made on data? Why are decisions of this kind being made on belief, mythology, etc., etc.? CSIRO should be, I mean, if this, system, if this model was working, why isn't CSIRO able to fund itself on its own? It's still reliant, however, on taxpayer funds. And now it's on. Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, just to, just so that we don't get confused, because sometimes people mix up two things. So they say, "Can you do R and D without patents?" And of course you can. I mean, penicillin was an example. And the neglected disease field, we've got 300 products, some of which uh, the patents are kind of irrelevant. Some don't have patents. Some the academic holds it. Some the company holds it. So it's uh, that's absolutely yes. Of course you can do R and D without patents. So I think we should put that aside because we know the answer. The the, the the thing is that patents, can you raise money without patents is the real question. The, the purpose of patents isn't to stimulate, it, it doesn't play any role in R&D, it just brings in the money. So what we're looking at is, is there a substitute, as you said, is there a substitute for patents? And you're saying it should be publicly funded. And, and that's, that, that's probably true, I mean, in, in many cases. But the thing is, it's very hard to, as you've said, it's hard to persuade governments to put up $50 billion a year. They, it, it's hard to do. And they like patents because it saves them having to put it up or having the risk. In fact, though, they pay for it in the end. It's not like the company. <laughs> the company passes on the cost. It's just that governments prefer to pay at the end because in their heads they say, I'm not paying for all the failures. Of course they are. The company factors in the cost of the failure. But in a government's head, it's better to pay at the, let the company take the risk and put the money up front and they buy the end product. So it's a matter of persuading them that they have to take the risk and put the money in all the way up front for everything we need, every drug we ever make. That's a really hard ask. So the, the question should be, what other ways are they raising money? And, and not get confused with, ca can we do R&D without patents? Because of course we can. Um, look, uh, in terms of counterfeiting drugs, um, are you talking about drugs that are produced um, because they're in, they infringe a patent, or are you talking about just drugs that are produced um, backyard laboratory that don't actually that doesn't actually contain any active ingredient? What, it's that, yeah.
Yeah, I, look, you know, look in in Australia, we're lucky. We've got the, you know, we've got a reasonably good regulatory system. I suppose the same goes for most developed countries in the developing world. Um, it, you're going to have the same problems. It's the regulations and the way the regulations are administered are lax, and there aren't the there aren't, there aren't the proper enforcement enforcement systems to ensure that. And we're not talking about patent infringing drugs. We're talking about drugs of poor quality. Um, then um, this is a serious issue. Um, um, how do we deal with it? Um, have uh, I mean, have better regulate have have better regulation within these developing countries? Yes, I absolutely agree because mm. the issue with fake drugs or sub quality drugs is not patent. It can be within and out or outside a patent. Yeah. Even whether it's a patent or not, so it is protect the, you know, the quality of the drug. I mean, even even the mechanism really. is absolutely no, no. The mechanism is totally different. You have a totally diff totally different authority that is supposed to take care of these things, you know, and it's not dependent upon the patent is there. Yeah, not not. The, unfortunately, there's some confusion already growing. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. There's a there's a um, an international agreement called the Anti Counterfeit and Trade Agreement, which has been uh, signed by Australia, but has yet to come into force. And there is some opposition. There's a lot of opposition to this agreement. Um, and part of the reason why there's opposition to it is the the terminology in the agreement. It, it directly linked counterfeiting to intellectual property infringement. And it's confusing the issue, especially in relation to drugs, because there's a separate counterfeiting problem, as, as, you, as you've identified. I mean, even I think last week in the United States, um, Genentech issued warnings over an, a, a counterfeit Avastin. Um, and I mean, how do you deal with it? I mean, it's essentially passing off. I mean, what, what's going on here is that there are organisations who are going to rip off the trademark system. I mean, these these uh, Ampules of Avastin or bottles of Avastin use the same trademark. They look the same. The whole works. It's, um, it's not a question of intellectual property infringement. There's probably not even an active ingredient in those bottles, so there's no there's no patent infringement involved. It's just that they're merely passing off what is nonsense as an active drug for the purposes of making a lot of money. Uh, and that's criminal, and we need measures to stop that sort of behaviour. But I think that that can be done through other, you know, through policing mechanisms, uh, rather than relying on the patent system to um, to control that sort of behaviour. Question from a, an online um, person: There's a what effect and impact could the the myriad patent case? Currently, before the Fed Court, have on the question of patents and genetic materials, with respect to his ultimate aim of finding a political or policy solution to this problem. Um, okay. In Australia, we've got um, uh, the, the, the definition of patentable subject matter goes back to the, the legislation of 1623, manner of new manufacture. So this particular case, the Myriad case, is about interpreting that provision in the context of isolated BRCA1 genetic mutations. Are isolated BRCA1 genetic mutations, as defined in the patent, patentable subject matter within the term manner of new manufacture? The court decision, when it's handed down, will be interesting. Um, unfortunately, it may have very little impact in Australia because the Advisory Council on Intellectual Property uh, was asked to, um, and this, this was a direct spin-off from the um, <coughs> the report that was prepared by the Australian Law Reform Commission on gene patents, one of the recommendations was that they look into the definition of patentable subject matter. Um, and eventually that inquiry happened and uh, ACIP um, brought down its report last year. And the report says, we recommend a new definition of patentable subject matter. Now, if that new definition becomes law, um, then it won't matter what this court decides because it'll be a new definition, which is one of the reasons why we need actually a legislative uh, prohibition uh, in the Patents Act in relation to isolated biological materials to stop this sort of 
legislative gaming. But to answer the question, assuming that doesn't become the law and we're, we still have the existing uh, definition of patentable subject matter, well, I think that uh, the decision could have a major uh, impact on neutralizing um, the current breadth of scope in terms of pat patenting of natural biological materials. Um, I'm hoping that it will. Um, as to what happens over the next few years in relation to intellectual property, the intellectual property development, on particularly the Patents Act, it will depend on what happens to this government, for instance. Um, um, uh, under, under Minister Carr, there was pretty much almost no real uh, interest in reforming and seriously reforming the patent system. Yes, we have the raising the bar bill, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, uh, which actually, uh, when passed, will introduce a specific research exemption into the Patents Act. Um, but in terms of really dealing with the serious issues as over scope of patenting, that bill doesn't do it. The new minister, Greg Combey, uh, may have a different approach, but we just don't know what's going to happen because we now have a leadership, a leadership tussle on Monday and depending on how that, ha that works out, we may have a, a, a cabinet reshuffle and, and Kim Carr has made no secret of the fact that he would prefer to be um, the Minister for Industry and Innovation rather than the Minister for Manufacturing. So if, uh, I imagine if Kevin Rudd is uh, appointed um, leader next Monday and Kim Carr is reappointed to his old portfolio, um, we may very well be stuck with um, a new law that um, ASIP has recommended and who knows, it's anyone's guess. Uh, okay. No more um, questions on this, um, then thank you very much for okay. that, very interesting. Um,